ברוכים הבאים לכולם מירושלים. The new episode of Israelites podcast, live from Jerusalem. Shalom lekulam from Stefano, directly from Jerusalem. Here we are, new episode of Israelites podcast. And today we are continuing our series on replacement theology, but now we're going to move on restoration theology. Before... Passing over to Pastor Chad with the first question. First of all, welcome again, Pastor Thank you. Chad. I just want to remind you all the way you can get connected to us and with us on our YouTube uh, page and channel. Remember, King of Kings Ministries, YouTube, and then on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, and our Instagram page is Realities Podcast. Now, Pastor Chad... Welcome again. Thank you. Yeah, Glad to be back. A, some time to, before going in what my professor used to do in the nitty gritty of the matter. How are you today? Um, I'm doing well. Family Praise God. Doing well. Family is good and uh, the kingdom is growing. A King of Kings family is doing well. Uh, and we try to stay focused. We try to stay focused on identifying potential leaders, training them, discipling them, mentoring them, uh, planting new congregations, uh, primarily in Israel. And, uh, and then covering all of that with our prayer centers, serving on the ground, the humanitarian aid centers. So uh, the King of Kings family is growing. That's amazing. So today we are going to continue the conversation, moving from replacement theology, which was a great foundation on how people think that God has rejected Israel. But now we're going to move into restoration theology, which is actually what people may think that God has refused and rejected the church itself. Right. So give us more an understanding of restoration, why it's called restoration theology, what we mean by it. Well, I think when you get into the Messianic Jewish movement, <clears throat> you have a temptation to think that we have solved everything that we are the true and one and only style of believers uh, in the world. And while we would look at Messianic Jewish theology as a very accurate picture of the New Covenant being lived out, especially for those that are called to do that, we can do that, we can live a Messianic Jewish life without rejecting the Church. So we rejected replacement theology. Okay, so that was a has God rejected Israel? And we've said no. But now restoration theology helps us to understand that God is not rejecting the Gentile church either. So I don't want arrogance on either side of this. I'm, I'm following in the footsteps of Paul in Romans 11, neither side be arrogant. You're one new man engrafted in the vine working together. So, so what's the concept uh, of this restoration theology? Why is it important? Well, what do we read about in the New Covenant? you know, what did the early believers look like? What did the early congregations that were planted, what did they look like governmentally, theologically, doctrinally, uh, in regard to their culture and engagement with the society around them, versus what do we see today? Um, And what have we seen throughout history? Uh, I know that you're going through a master's program right now, and you're actually in a course on church history, so this is going to be very relevant for you as well. But what has been the history of the body of Messiah, and do we think God is pleased with that? So restoration theology, in its summary form, is what was the body of Messiah in the beginning? What did it look like? What did it lose along the way? And then what is being restored right now in today's world. So interesting. So let's start from the beginning with church history. But before moving into church history, let's go into some biblical foundation of restoration theology. Where do we find restoration theology in the Bible itself? And then we move into church history. Well, we want to start off with, um, you and I were discussing uh, Acts chapter 1. Yeah. Okay. And in Acts chapter 1, we have the Messiah has finished his earthly ministry He's uh, died as our Passover lamb. He's resurrected as our first fruits, resurrection from the dead. He is going to ascend after the, you know, the, the 40 days he's with us. Uh, he's ascending to heaven. And as he goes up, the angel speaks to the disciples and said, you know, men of Israel, he will return in the same way that 
he has left you. So there's two components to that returning. Number one, that Yeshua will return to the same place in the same style in which he left, but also he's returning to something he should recognize. Mm -hmm. The Bible uses this idea about the bride quite often, that Yeshua is the bridegroom. We collectively are the bride. But uh, in, in ancient Israeli tradition, once an engagement was made, the bridegroom would go away. He would go away and build a house. Now, no one knew how long that would take. He had people that he would station in the town that would announce his return, and the bride and all of her team with her, her bridesmaids, had to be ready. This is where you get the parable about the virgins and the oil, or you get the parables about the end of the age and the blowing of the trumpet to announce the return of the bridegroom. All of this fits together because of ancient Israeli tradition. But that means the bridegroom, the Messiah in this case, needs to be returning to a bride he recognizes. And it's unfortunate that after we read in the early sections of the New Covenant, what the body of Messiah became through the next thousands of years doesn't look a lot like what we read about in the early portions of the Bible. And I think getting back to what did we look like in the first century, the process of doing that is called restoration theology. So if we go back to what you were saying about the marriage style, um, I remember Yeshua saying something, I will go away for a while in my father's house, there are many places, and then when I finish to build that, I'm going to come back. It's like the, the, the similarities with the Jewish marriage style. Very much. And you could take this a little further. When the Messiah talks about returning, gathering his people, the wedding clothes parable, about the people who would not wear the wedding clothes provided by the host family, they are thrown out into darkness, and others that wore the right wedding clothes were invited in. Then you have the wedding supper of the Lamb. Uh, all of these stories and parables and analogies teach us what the relationship should look like between Messiah, the bridegroom, and all of the believers collectively, which are the bride. But the bridegroom needs to recognize the bride. I mean, I can't imagine that when I got engaged to my wife, Rebecca, had I gone away for a while and I came back and I didn't recognize her, how I would feel about a potential bride that I no longer recognize. She looked different, talked different, acted different, lived in a different style than she did before. That would be concerning to me. I need to return to a bride that I recognize. And it's sad to say, and as we might even go through a few steps of this today, the body of Messiah stopped looking like the way Yeshua built it. So before Yeshua returns, few things need to be restored. That's right. That's why it's called restore. That's right. Okay, perfect. That's very clear. So um, let's go back to church history now. Okay. So moving from the first century early Christianity up to today, some examples. So early on, of course, you read the um, Acts of the Apostles, you read the Epistles of Paul, the pastoral epistles as well, and you get a sense of just how Jewish-rooted this movement is. Now, of course, it should be Jewish-rooted because it's rooted in the Torah, it's rooted in the Jewish prophets, it's rooted in Israel. Yeshua is a Jewish Messiah, and he's calling his Jewish disciples to him, and they're building uh, inside of Israel the early congregations. All of this is done in the backdrop of what? The temple, the synagogues, the Sabbath, the feasts, the festivals, the kosher laws, the biblical mandates. The temple is there. The priesthood is there. The sacrifices are still going on. That's the backdrop of all of this. So when we interpret the scriptures, we need to interpret them from the proper context. What is going on in the background? It's not just the author and the audience and the intent of the author. It's also what is the contextual background of the time. In, in everything in the New Covenant, of course, the backdrop is still Jerusalem is at the center of all of this. We speak of the moral implications of the law connecting um, Gentiles to the Jews in the sense of morality, at least as a, as a baseline, as a simplistic baseline. But the early body of Messiah, as Jewish as it was, keeping Sabbath, going to the temple to worship, keeping all the feasts and festivals, keeping kosher, we never see Yeshua break a law. Mm -hmm. We never see him teach anyone else to break a law. We don't see the apostles being taught that or exampling that. We don't see Paul exampling that. Paul even talks about 
Synagogue is my regular practice. Yeshua said, it is my regular practice to be in the synagogues as well. So very Jewish in its orientation. But then early on, in the first couple of centuries, we start to see the early Gentile church fathers pull away. They pull away from the Jewish roots of faith. Now, there's some historical reasons why that might have happened. When the Jewish people in mass numbers rejected the Messiah, even though there was a faithful remnant, that might have opened the door for judgment. God comes in to discipline and chastise Israel by allowing Rome to not only rule over Israel, but destroy the temple, persecute the believers, and then that scatters the believers all over the world, right? So now the center has always been Jerusalem. Go to Acts 15, you'll see that James is still the head apostle in Jerusalem, making the final ruling. But, but Jerusalem can't be the center anymore after all this destruction. The word of the Lord goes further out, and once it's further out, Rome becomes the center point, as it's the fastest growing, the largest number of believers. But in that environment, you've lost the Israeli environment. You've lost that Jewish influence. And then if you go as early as Constantine, you're going to find the Council of Nicaea intentionally takes out the Jewish people and intentionally takes out all references to Israel, the Jewishness of the Messiah or the apostles, or the Jewishness of the New Covenant. So now this becomes the new backdrop. The new backdrop is, wait a second, the first thing that was lost from the body of Messiah that Yeshua would recognize, the first thing that was lost was the Jewish roots of the faith. And that's a problem. It's not the only thing lost, but it was certainly the first thing lost. And so when we go back to early church history, we're going to say the first thing lost was the Jewish roots of the faith. And then what I'm studying right now is the Christendom, in which the state and the church becomes together, becomes one. And of course, there's nothing of Jewish roots on that. And there is a brand new traditions and everything is moving from the roots of Ju Judaism into the new tradition of Constantine, Constantinople and Rome, the two different ideas of the West and the East of Christianity that moves completely from that. But my question is, what do we expect to be restored before the return of the Messiah? That's a good question. So let's kind of uh, take some steps building off of that first concept of the first thing that was lost was the Jewish roots of faith. Mm. But over time, with people trying to control the influence of religion, having the state to use it as powerful influence, other things were lost. The concept of discipleship was lost. The concept of a full body immersion under the water that we see Yeshua and his cousin John doing, that full body immersion was replaced with sprinkling. You, you have the concept of, instead of uh, small groups in a home and confessing your sins to one another. Now we confess to this priest father person. Yeah. Um, then it was, you know, you have to really dive deeply into the power of God, the Holy Spirit, but that's a little messy sometimes and people don't want to deal with it. So they start to reject the Holy Spirit's impact and his power and the giftings. Now the giftings are gone. We don't have giftings in the kingdom of God. We don't believe in biblical congregational government anymore. We have this idea of super pastors or independent people or whatever it is. We don't believe in elders and deacons anymore, and, and that just gets pushed to the side as we're walking through through the history. We don't believe in the supernatural anymore. Do we even believe uh, in, in, in a methodical nature of making disciples, or do we believe in small groups? All of that is lost along the way until somewhere in the Middle Ages we find ourselves with a state-run controlled church that really only exist on the basis of, well, the priest makes all the rules, the Pope makes all the rules, and all of the things that we would have recognized in the early body of Messiah is no longer recognizable in that church world. Yeah. It's a completely lost. Yeah. And so all of those things are the things that need to be restored. And in Restoration Theology, we believe that God had uh, used and will continue to use various parts of his body to restore the things that were lost. And that's where it gets fun, because we can go through a few examples uh, that make it tangible to see what happened and who did it and what was lost and what was restored. Um, so we could use some examples. We could say, 
The people that believed in full body immersion, or let's call it for the sake of this moment, a full water baptism, the Baptists, they believe in the full water immersion. So is it possible that the Baptists, that denominational thread was used by God to restore the concept of full body immersion? Or was it the Pentecostals who believe in the restoration of the move of the Holy Spirit, power, gifting, supernatural? Uh, Is it maybe the Episcopalian branch that believed again in the concept of right congregational government and order? Um, Maybe it was the, the Calvinists who believed in accountability or discipleship again, or maybe it was the Lutherans who believe in the authority of the Word of God, because there was a time where it was thought that even the Bible wasn't the authority, the Pope was. So we can look at this in short and say, each time something crucial was lost from the body of Messiah, the Lord was able to use a branch of his family, a a thread or a stream denomination of his family, to help restore that piece back to the bride. And then we would say, well, what is the Messianic Jewish part of the body doing? Well, we're restoring the Jewish roots of faith. Mm. We're, we're being used by God as part of this restoration theology. What hasn't been restored yet? Well, here's, here's the good news. Uh, for me, if I'm reading this correctly, it's often seen that what is res- lost first gets restored last. And so it kind of goes in reverse order of redemption. Okay. So if, in fact, we claim that Jewish roots of faith was lost first— then the Jewish roots of faith should be the last major piece that is returned to the body of Messiah. And I think you're starting to see it now, the growth of Messianic Jewish understanding, Messianic Jewish congregations around the world, the Gentile church waking up to how important Israel is and starting to preach a little bit more accurately from the backdrop and the context of Israel being that which is in the text. I think we're starting to see that this last piece of the puzzle is being restored now, Messianic Jewish theology, this Jewish roots of faith, is being restored now. So I see on a timeline, if I'm looking at the prophetic nature of the timeline, Messianic Judaism is extremely important when you start to talk about your interest in eschatology. We hear a lot here in Israel about restoration theology, but I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not such a popular teaching out there in the West, in Europe, or United States, and, and so on. Do you agree with me on that? And I, I think so, I th- and I think it's because um, the context in which people are studying and they're learning and what they're going through often finds itself very specifically looking at the individual. But what we're talking about is a much larger picture. We're talking about centuries of the body of Messiah, both lost, returned, and its growth and maturity. We're talking about the, the prophetic timeline of God. We're talking about the eschatological timeline of God. And these are some pretty big topics that not a lot of people have time or have had interest yet to sit down and think about. And so I think maybe our job is to help awaken them to it, to inspire them to it. And what I said to you just a few minutes ago, I can reiterate now, and that is this, that if you're interested in eschatology, the end of the age and the timeline of that, then restoration theology should also be of interest to you because it helps us to define where are we at on that eschatological prophetic timeline of God to the end of the age. Apart from Acts chapter 1, verse 11 that you mentioned before, do we have any other biblical foundation on restoration theology? Well, what's interesting about it is you don't see a lot of things lost yet in the New Covenant because it's still being written at the time, right? So it doesn't start to creep in until later in the first century with the early church fathers and the centrality and the authority of the Word of God and of the early apostles, it has to move outside of Jerusalem. And we don't really see the first evidences of this uh, losing pieces of the puzzle until it's outside of Jerusalem and devoid of the Jewish influence. So most times you're not going to see the brokenness of this concept until after the New Testament is already finished being written, or at least the, the parts that we embrace in the canon, they've already been written and delivered. Do you think we have any prophecy in the First Testament to mention about the restoration of, of, of 
the thing, the last things at the end of... Yeah, I think it's what's clear to me is the patterns of Scripture. So oftentimes we talk about the importance of Israel in everybody's uh, per- perception, in their line of sight, and that is because however God treats Israel is how He will treat us, mm-hmm. right? So let's go back to how did He treat Israel. Well, what He said to Israel was this, I'm going to take you out of Egypt, and I'm going to take you to your own land, and I'm going to prosper you, and at some point during that prosperity, you're going to forget about me, mm-hmm. and you're going to start dropping pieces of our covenant together. But don't worry, over time, I'm going to bring the prophets, and they're going to remind you of these pieces that you need to restore back to your life. You know, we can look at Moses. Moses was part of the first Exodus. He's part of the first Passover. But we also learn in Exodus and the rest of the Torah that Moses didn't circumcise his son Gershom. He violated the scriptures, and God reminded him, and then finally his wife Zipporah stepped in and, and circumcised Gershom. We also learned that under Joshua, the children of Israel had not been celebrating the feasts, specifically Passover, and God commands them, you must restore this. So if we see Israel losing pieces of their covenantal bride, if you will, that covenantal element, and God helping them to restore it, it should be the same with the new covenant body. The things we've lost, the things we've forgotten about, God will help us to restore them also, the same way he helped the prophets with the restoration of Israel. Now, I have a tricky question for you, Pastor Chad. I hope you can answer to it. (laughs) Now, in the concept of restoration theology, thinking at the eschatological problem of Israel, are you trying to say that despite Yeshua, Israel is going to be saved anyway because of the restoration theology and God's covenant with Israel? I'm going to look at Romans 11 again for this, and it talks about... um, the engrafted vine, Jew and Gentile working together as the one new man. It gives the Gentile commission, which is to provoke the Jew to jealousy. And then it's, it speaks about not being arrogant. Just because you've been engrafted, don't be arrogant. And Jews, just because you were the natural branches, don't be arrogant. But as you get further in Romans 11, it starts to use this language that the giftings and callings of God are irrevocable. That means the call of Israel can never be taken away. It can never be replaced. But it also says that all of Israel will be saved. So we need to break this down a little bit, because all Israel will be saved almost sounds like an automatic. It doesn't matter what you do, how you live, and what you think. You're going to be saved even if you don't want to be saved. Too bad you're going to be saved, because all Israel will be saved. And how we would address this is a a literary technique that we see in the Bible many times, and that is the usage of the word all to represent the majority. Very good. Versus all meaning every single, right? So uh, in some cases, you you might even uh, say this. You might say, all Israel rejected the Torah, and God came with his judgment with Babylon and Assyria, and he exiled them out of Israel because all of Israel rejected the Lord. Well, the problem with the word all in that context is we know of the faithful remnant of 7,000 prophets with Elijah. We know of many of the writers of the prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah. We know about Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, Esther and Mordecai. You know, we know about so many faithful that the all have rejected the Lord doesn't mean every single because we actually have the remnant. And that goes back to the remnant theology that you and I had discussed on a previous podcast. So if we apply that same context to Romans 11, all Israel will be saved, I think it's a better interpretation to move from the remnant, meaning a few Messianic Jewish believers, to a large number of Messianic Jewish believers at the end of the age, once this restoration theology is running its full circle, and we see a large number of Jews come to faith according to Romans 11, and then we get the last great harvest of the age. So In this context, I'm seeing all meaning large number or majority. It does not necessarily have to mean every single Jew. Is it correct to use this principle? I was, as you were talking, I was looking online to find 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that says that God desires all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Can we use the same concept for the all world word here in this passage, or is it different? Well, I think when we're talking about God's love for people, whether it's 1 Timothy, whether it's John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the whole world, all in the world, 
from his love, these are all his children, so of course he's going to love all. The question is, when a prophetic word is spoken, is there a choice? Does someone have the opportunity to choose into that covenant or to choose out of that covenant? And in those contexts, the word all needs to then be understood more along the lines of the choice. Many will choose, but it doesn't mean every single person is forced to choose, because that would be a violation of what we call covenant theology. Covenant theology is uh, exists on the basis of everything we do with the Messiah and his kingdom is based on a choice. We choose to be in his kingdom. He doesn't force us to be in his kingdom. And if he were to prophesy something like, every single person must be saved, then that's no longer a covenant theological choosing Um, But in this case, I think it fits better, not from God's love perspective, which would include every single, he loves every single person, but it's coming from the covenant choice perspective of everyone has been offered, that's the word all, meaning every single person has been offered, but not every single person might choose into it. And so from that perspective, it's a little bit safer to say uh, a larger number or a majority of Israel will, will be saved. So the choice element is part on the Jew being in God's covenant and for the Gentiles being God's covenant. That's right. Because what you don't want to see is this uh, slightly ridiculous thought, which is um, hell full of people who don't want to be there Mm -hmm. and heaven full of a whole bunch of people who don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Right? So covenant theology being based on choice and free will, you don't want to see heaven full of a whole bunch of people that would rather leave I don't want to be here. You forced me. You prophesied all Israel has to be saved, and so I'm here, but I don't want to be here. So that I take that to an extreme only to point out how ridiculous the line of thought is if we somehow lose that covenantal choice. So when we're talking about eschatological things, the harvest at the end of the age, restoration theology, returning the Jewish roots to faith to the body of Messiah, and a large number of Jews coming to faith according to Romans 11 then we have to insert covenant theology and free will choice, and we'd say at that point, maybe it's not every single. Now, I would love it if it was every single Jew. That's great. That means the gospel uh, did, it went through all of Israel and did an amazing job. But I also leave room for the fact that there's a choice. Maybe not every Jew chooses, right? But it, I can't, I can't only lean toward free will. I also have to lean into the balance of, yes, but the Bible says all Israel, so it seems like a vast majority will, will come to faith. Very good. As we recap on this topic, um, why do we believe to reject replacement theology and embracing restoration theology? Let's recap the two episodes together for our followers. Well, replacement theology says when you do something wrong, you get kicked out and you get replaced by another group. So the Jews didn't believe in Messiah, or the Jews disobeyed the Torah, uh, they haven't been faithful, and somehow they have been kicked off the team, and the new, the new better church, Gentile world has replaced them. So the logical fallacy here is, of course, well, then we have to apply that principle to everybody. If we, as individuals, fail and sin, then we get kicked out and we lose our salvation. So that doesn't seem to be how the Bible works, because it allows for repentance and humility and, and restoration of the individual. Well, the same thing is true of the Gentile church world. If, if we were to look at the history of the church, uh, the Gentile church world, and we were to look at church fathers and all the problems we've had, mistakes we've made, then we should be rejected too. So now Israel's been rejected, the individual has been rejected, and the Gentile church world has been rejected— and replaced with whom? Who is left to replace that? So there's no really there's no logical progression here that that ends up at the end of the road with consistency. But rather the Bible is very consistent that if you do not persist in sin, then God in his faithfulness and his mercy will receive your repentance and restore you. So that's where restoration theology comes in. Yes, the Jews might have failed in a lot of ways, but God didn't reject them. Yes, the church may have failed in a lot of ways, but God didn't reject them. They're the one new man, two sheep pens under one shepherd. And so it is with us as the bride of Messiah. We've made some mistakes. We've lost some things. We've rejected the ways of God. But in God's faithfulness and his patience, He will take us through a slow process of restoration through the centuries, and he will use different people, different streams of the body to bring back important pieces. And this is why at King of Kings and hopefully in the Messianic Jewish worldwide, we don't hate the church. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. We are not church haters. Do we believe there's some gaps? Sure. But let's be humble. We probably have gaps too. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen is God using the church to restore important parts to his body, just like he's used the Messianic Jewish movement to restore the Jewish roots of faith to his body. So we are part of the one world ecclesia. Mm. We're not... Messianic Jews on one side, Gentiles on the other side. We are engrafted into the same vine. Yes, one might be the natural branch, and yes, one might be the wild branch, but both are engrafted into the same vine. So that's why it's important to embrace restoration theology as you start to answer, why do we reject replacement theology? Yeah. One thing I know for sure, I haven't found a tricky question for Pastor Chad yet, but if you have a tricky question for Pastor Chad, Remember our email address on podcast at kkm.network, podcast at kkm.network. And I'm waiting for your comment and your question, Pastor Chad. I really enjoyed these two episodes, Replacement Theology, Restoration Theology. Um, thank you so much for your insight. It's been really, really powerful. And I am sure that we're going to receive great comments on this episode and the previous one. Thank well, you so as much. As always, my honor and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom from Jerusalem. Thanks for listening to this episode of Israelities Podcast. We'd love to hear your questions and comments at podcast at kkm.network. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram. Shalom from Jerusalem.